morning. Good morning. We are here on what is officially known as the Diamond 44 moorings, but we are going to call the cow moorings because of the cattle at the end of the moorings. Well, not just at the end. They can come right up to the fence. Well, they do, and they walk along right up the fence, but they seem to hang out down at the end because there's a location there where they can climb down, and they've kind of turned it all to mud and muck where they get in to get a good lick of the canal when they're thirsty. Oh, nice. And uh, apparently a boater behind us that's moored up said that they were moored up in that same location a couple of years back when a cow tripped, fell in, and ended up stuck between their boat and the um, uh, siding for a while. And they had to like unstrap the boat and then like get it out of the way and then the cow swam across the canal and then couldn't get back and then swam back and yeah it was a whole whole thing whole thing she also said to look out for otters okay so look Perfect. out for otters and cattle <laughs> in the canal we are heading up the lock today yes how far i'm sure oh i think we'll go to the end to the end we're fully committed we're not fully committed <laughs> i just don't know what you're like i'll be like oh this looks nice should we stop it no onward. well okay so my thing is is that the the sort of known moorings at the beginning of the lark are really at the beginning of the lark. Yeah. I wasn't fully committed to going to the end, but now I am. So. Uh, <laughs> that easy to do. <laughs> so the end of the lark. Sold him the idea. Yeah. There's one lock on the way at Ishulam. Oh, yeah, I got to a lock. I uh, probably pronounced that wrong, but um, I was looking at the map again today, and it is funny how the lock is shown going in one direction. And then on the inset portion of the map, it's shown going in the other direction. So I have well, really no idea which direction. I'm assuming it will get, will go up the lock. I think we'll be, it'll be clarified when we get there. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go and find out. It's right. exciting. Will it be up or will it be down? Yes. You're going to go photograph the cows? No. Yeah, you should go photograph the cows. Or do you want me to go photograph the cows? I'll go photograph the cows. Excited puppy. George, where are the cows? This way. There's a sign here asking boaters to slow down past the moorings. I think it's fair to say that this is ignored by at least 50% of river users. The junction with the River Lark is over by those buildings on the right bank ahead, so not at all far from the mooring we stayed at last night. Coming from the south, it's quite an acute turn onto the Lark, but the river is wide here and it's a pretty easy turn. It also helps that there's no other boats around at the moment. As soon as you make the turn, you pass under the ATM road bridge. The Lark is the third tributary of the River Great Ouse that we've visited, having previously explored the Wizzy and the Little Ouse in recent weeks. After this, there's also the River Cam to cruise on, which is a little further south. This boat can't have moved for a while, judging by all the reeds growing around it. The moorings on the right here are the Grey Twos Boating Association moorings, and just beyond them are some EA moorings on the left hand side. The River Lark is just 23 miles long from its source near Bury St Edmunds to the junction with the River Ouse. Only about 10 miles are currently navigable, although until 1894 you could travel all the way to Bury St Edmunds itself.
Once we cross under the railway line, we're passing the village of Prickwillow. It's a wonderful name, apparently derived from prickets of willow that were grown here. They were long thin stems that were used to make thatch. Originally, it was the River Ouse that passed here until it was rerouted to its current course along the Queen Adelaide Strait from Littleport. In Prickwillow, there were two rather smart EA mooring pontoons. This one has a water tap too. And just under the bridge between the two moorings is a winding hole. As we pass the winding hole, we get a brief glimpse of the engine museum, which is housed in an old pumping station, one of many along this river. Pumping stations, that is, not museums. And there's the other EA mooring. Much of this area is below sea level, and so steam pumping engines were installed to drain the land for farming. Now, electric pumps do the job. We're about two miles from the Ouse here, so we have eight miles to go till we reach the end of the navigation. There actually aren't any more bridges between here and there, although waters can cross the navigation at the lock, I suppose. This section of the river is incredibly straight, and as I look at the map, I notice that there are many farms on both sides of the water here. There's Lark Engine Farm, Spooner's Farm, Shell Farm, King's Farm, Cockin Farm, Lark Hall Farm, Alder Farm, Delft Farm, and Elderbury Farm. I'm not sure which one these sheep live on, but it's very nice to see the lambs. There's also footpaths on both sides of the river, but we don't see any walkers about. Either these reeds grow very quickly, or this boat hasn't moved in a while. That's the old Fodderfen pumping station. Built in 1843, it once housed a steam engine that drove a scoop wheel. on the left bank you can see a hexagonal building, which is all that remains of a wind pump that dates back to the 18th century. Apparently it's known locally as the pepper pot. All of these moorings are long-term moorings, and I think they're managed by Fenland boats. Well, that's one way to make a floating home. We had been told that the Lark is the least picturesque of the used tributaries, but it's honestly lovely here too. Local boaters are really spoilt for choice in this area. We've seen many of these common terns fishing, but this is the first one we've caught on camera making a dive. 
In the distance, we spot the one lock on this navigation, and it'll be the first lock we've done since we came off the relief channel. The lock is set against us, so the first thing we need to do is close the upstream guillotine gate. Happily, it's fully electronic. Once it's fully closed, we can open the sluices on the lower gates. And once the water's drained, we can swing the gates. All of which is done from one of the two control panels. Once the gates are shut, I close the sluices again. Then it's back to the control panel for the guillotine gate. Both panels are opened with the Abloy nav key. Inside each box are full instructions on how to operate the lock. When you press the raise gate button, the guillotine rises just enough to let some water in and then it stops. After three to five minutes, the lock fill delay active light goes out and you can raise the gate the rest of the way to let the boat through. The timer delay ensures that water doesn't flood into the lock too quickly. There isn't much of a rise on this lock, so it's fairly safe, but on deeper locks, this is really helpful. After the delay active light goes out, I can raise the gate the rest of the way. On this navigation, you actually leave the gates open when you leave, but I must admit, it does feel a bit strange walking away from a lock without closing the gate behind me. Above the lock we pass the Riverside Isla Marina, although the 100 or so boats that moor here actually access it from below the lock. There's also wooden lodges here that are privately owned, although I did find one for rent on Airbnb. Here's a glimpse of one of the many World War II pillboxes that we've seen in the area. We're just two miles from the end of the navigation now, and above the lock the river feels really different. For one it's narrower, but most noticeably it's no longer straight, with many meanders from here to the end. In places the vegetation also encroaches over the banks of the water.
We reach the end of the navigation and turn around. There's a pub here and you can moor outside it like this blue narrowboat, but we decide to head all the way back to Prickwillow. We didn't actually film too much of the return trip, but here are a few quick highlights. We're here. We've arrived. We're in Prickwillow. Still one of the funniest main places I've come across. It's funny, this morning you, you said we might not go, like we might war on one of the first moorings or whatever. Yeah, I, I wasn't fully you, committed to going to the end. Yeah, I thought you meant on our way to the end, not once we've been to the end and back again. Oh well, this is what uh, happens. That was nice. I really like the lark. You start teasing me, you're all like, you know, oh, knowing Michael, he'll want to go to the end. Well, now I do. We did, and, it, and we did, yeah. and it was nice. Yeah, it was real nice. Yeah. Um, there's a surprising number of small boats up in the reeds. There's one over there by the bridge, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they've been moored there a long time, and the river's just kind of flooded them up and over and left them there. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, it's a it's an interesting stretch. Um, we'd gotten quite a few people saying, "Oh, it's not as it's not like the Wizzy, and it's not like the um, Brandon Creek slash Little Ooze." It's not as interesting, you know, and I thought they were talking like it would be awful. Well, I, I just, the way to describe that, I thought it would be sort of more, I don't know, industrial or, yeah. you know, or that it was really more of a drainage ditch or something. And, and though it does have a couple of sections that are just long and straight and do feel like a very man-made structure. Especially when you're going past all the moored boats. Yeah. And, the, you know, there's a bit of slowness around there, but like you get up to the end and through the lock. And there's lots of little wiggly wobblies and, and yeah, and it's kind of all kind of feels all forested. I mean, it's it's not a small wood, but it's it's there. It provides some nice shade from the sun. Yeah. There's you know some World War Two era um, pillboxes, yeah. including one that's just completely surrounded <laughs> by and taken over by um, uh, grow. Yeah, like um, it's a kudzu or what's it called the the climbing vines and uh and yeah it's just i don't know I, I thought it was really quite interesting there is a fair amount of wildlife there's a lot of fish yeah. you can see in the water there are apparently quite a few otters but i didn't see any otters i did see some herons close up um they normally fly off so much more quickly but twice today we passed herons that were just quite too. close and both times i didn't have my camera right? <laughs> um yeah Oh, the end was really nice. I thought it was totally worth going up to the end. Although I got to admit, like the turning point sort of sucked. And oh, well, I, mainly because it was very windy when we were there. Well, it was windy, and you, it wasn't really obvious that you needed to turn right into a little straight channel that's quite narrow and rotate over. And when you when I reversed up to do that, that's when I noticed that there were these. Um, extended pieces of wood yeah, pylon. they were a pain. Yeah, so it's like, well, I had to dodge those things. So it was useful to have you at the front to, you, to use the pole to push off. You could have stopped. We could have moored at the end at the pub. And actually, I kind of feel like a nice, drink. Even, slow, <laughs> icy yeah. drink now. But um, the moorings outside the pub looked like they'd seen better days. So we just decided to come back here. Yeah, the, 
the wood supports underneath were all cracked any. and they were far back yeah that's what i mean and it, so it looked like, it like the, a bit of a lever it was yeah it was sort of an overhang and i was like i'm pretty george would have no problem he'd walk along there and it would just rattle a bit george, joe could jump on and probably wouldn't fall through but i'd take the whole thing down <laughs> so yeah so it wasn't nice enough to stay and then plus the other advantage of coming back here it means we don't move tomorrow we just because we've got 48 hours on here so we can stay till like two or three o'clock on Sunday and go to the pumping museum hopefully mm -hmm. and, and then, then continue down to month yeah continue down to a train station where we need to be for Monday so yeah. it just means a day of no moving tomorrow on this yeah. rather nice prick willow 48 hour mooring yeah which is quite pleasant in the wind I hope that the wind keeps up because I've really enjoyed having a little bit more of a breeze today yeah. It's just been kind of, um, you know, stifling the last couple of days in terms yeah, of the heat. It's been, a lot. it's been beautiful, but it's just been a little bit hot inside the boat. So having a bit of breeze going through really helps and keeps the bugs at bay. Because, yeah. uh, uh, man, were we infested yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. George has started to bark, so I better go get him. Yeah. So thanks for watching. Give us a thumbs up. Comment down below. Subscribe if you haven't already. Subscribe to Minimalist Maximal Velocity if you want our time-lapse videos. And click that bell if you want to find out what happens after Prickwillow.